بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولكم ايفريوان ان ذس نيو ميتنج اوف ايجيبشن سوسايتي اوف نيفرولوجي اند ترانسبلانتيشن تيم اي تشابتر ميتنجز اور ميتنج توداي از ذا وان اوف ترانسبلانتيشن دايز اند وي هاف تو ذا بيج ستارز اوف كيدي ترانسبلانتيشن ان ايجيبت افريكا اند انترناشونالي Uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Ayman Rifai, President elect of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, head of uh, Transplantation Chapter Egyptian Society of Nephrology, and the, uh, the, uh, the Vice President of Mansoura Kidney and Urology Center in Mansoura yes. University. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the great moderator today is Professor Muhammad Ani Hafiz, the past president. Of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, and I am really honored to co-chair this session with him. Uh, Professor Muhammad Ani Hafiz is the current president of African Association of Nephrology and the current uh, MISOT, uh, Middle East uh, Society of Organ Transplantation General Secretary. We'll speak briefly about uh, immuno, uh, and we'll speak about immunosuppression. Don't to go deep and leave the floor to Professor Hani to introduce further Professor Ayman and the topic today, but is related to our immunosuppression protocols in kidney transplantation. So not to stay long between the two presidents and leave the floor to Professor Hani to uh, lead this meeting and introduce Professor Ayman and go with the meeting. So please, Professor Hani, start. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasser. Uh, it is my great honor and uh, privilege to welcome all of you in this first uh, scientific uh, meeting in 2024. Uh, and I think uh, a very good start to uh, be uh, to present Professor Ayman Rifai. Professor Ayman Rifai needs actually no introduction. He is uh, uh, beyond uh, what has been said, being the next president of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation. Uh, get, getting uh, his post uh, next month, February, from our dear uh, professor, Dr. Amai Hasaballah. He will be a president from uh, February 2024. And also, he has been recently uh, elected among uh, the Supreme Council of uh, Transplantation Committee in, uh, in Egypt, deciding uh, the policies of transplantation and hope that this committee will soon uh, take us to cadaveric uh, program uh, with the help of Professor Halawa and his uh, group uh, in making uh, new guidelines. And uh, also uh, Professor Ayman, uh, he, of course, is uh, chairing the scientific uh, committee of our next Egyptian Society and Nephrology Congress, which will uh, take place uh, from uh, uh, 13 to uh, 15 February next month. Uh, uh, and it will be honored by the presence of uh, ISN uh, big uh, professors, uh, the president-elect, and many others would be present in this uh, meeting, which uh, will be preceded by two days of research uh, program uh, uh, done by the ISN. And uh, this will be uh, a great event for the whole region. Uh, uh, without uh, uh, much... Uh, introductions, I will give uh, the floor to Professor Ayman Rifai to give us an, uh, the basics and practical essentials of immunosuppression and kidney transplantation. Thank you very much, Professor Hani, for your kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Afram, President. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yasser, for your um, a uh, huge effort in maintaining this meeting over the last three years without interruption, but with actually full enthusiasm. Thank you, Professor Yasser. Uh, Thank you, Professor Ayman. Thank you so much. Uh, and Happy New Year for you all. And uh, today's um, the uh, talk about immunosuppression in kidney transplantation I'm going to stress on the basics and uh, practical essentials. Uh, I'm not going to touch any uh, experimental agents or agents in the pipe stem 
but I will talk about the uh, actual and the um, agents in our hands and how to manipulate it in uh, our uh, clinical, uh, in everyday clinical practice. First of all, I'd like to dedicate this um, talk to two late professors. First, our beloved professor Hussein Shaisha, that every day we are missing him so much, actually, especially uh, when the East and T Congress is approaching. I always remembered him. Uh, he was giving uh, a big hand in prepare, preparation of the scientific agenda of the Congress. So may God bless his soul. And also for our late professor Rashad Barsoum, who asked me two years ago to prepare this presentation in a session uh, of transplantation that he was uh, sharing. So may God bless their souls. This is the aim of my, of my presentation, is to keeping the gift. And after a long journey of suffering of patients with end-stage renal disease, with dialysis and its complica complication, they are gifted a kidney. And how to keep this gift is by proper manipulation and handling of the immunosuppression. And I think that management of a transplant patient is an art we should always keep try to keep this balance, not being too little. Otherwise, graft um, rejection will occur, or not being too much. Otherwise, we will have a lot of serious uh, complications, infection, malignancy, etc. So we are like this man walking in a rope, trying to keep this balance. This is the agenda of my presentation will be in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to give an idea about the classification of the immune suppression, mechanism of action, administration, side effects, and interactions. And the second part will be more practical, talking about how to implement these um, transplantation, the immune suppressive protocols guided by the Egyptian practice guidelines and the studies on the our uh, on our uh, Egyptian transplant recipients. So let's start with the first part. First of all, what's the ideal immune suppression, which is actually not exist. Uh, the ideal immune suppression should be strongly immune suppressive, but more importantly, to be specific, not causing an overall state of immune suppression uh, with low toxicity for the other organs. It should have a long in vivo bioactivity, easy to use, and low cost. But I think this is uh, these all these criteria are not, are not exist in a single agents. So we have a lot of uh, challenges. Why? Because immunosuppressive drugs that we have nowadays lacks this immunogenic or antigen specificity. So there is increased risk of infections and malignancy, and uh, they fail to induce tolerance. Furthermore, there are a long term use, uh, the long term use of these drugs have a lot of many uh, non immunologic side effects uh, diabetes, cardiovascular, uh, bone disease, etc. I'm going to categorize the immunosuppressive uh, agents into three main categories induction therapy, maintenance therapy, and therapy used for uh, treatment of rejection. So let's start with the induction therapy. The induction therapy could be high dose of corticosteroid or depleting agents, which could be polyclonal like antithymocyte globulin or monoclonal like alemtuzumab, cambat one h or non-depleting agent like the uh, interleukin-2 receptor antagonist, basileximab. And the maintenance therapy, we have the corticosteroids, which is the corner stone of the uh, immunosuppressive regimen. We have calcineurin inhibitor with the cyclosporin tacrolimus, mTOR inhibitors, and anti-metabolites. 
the agents used for treatment of rejection for cell mediated rejection you can use pulse steroid or antithymethyl globulin but in antibody mediated rejection we usually use the IVIG and plasma pharesis with some complementary agents like rotuximab, bortezomib, or eclizumab. So this is the initial classification. Let's start with the induction therapy. Why we need induction therapy? Actually, for several reasons. Number one, to transplant high-risk patients, we need a potent uh, in therapy, induction therapy. Uh, second, to decrease the rate or instance of rejection episodes and to overcome the period of delayed graft function when the CNI uh, is contraindicated or cannot be used. We have to cover this area with uh, proper induction. And if we plan to apply a minimization protocol, whether to with the raw steroids or to avoid or delay the introduction of calcineurin inhibitors. So these are the indications of induction therapy. As I said earlier on, early on that um, uh, uh, the uh, induction therapy could be monoclonal or polyclonal, depleting or non-depleting. Uh, and these are uh, the examples. Basilix map, which is commonly used and since uh, late uh, 90s, it's a chimeric monoclonal antibody. Actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, we can handle it in a very, uh, I mean, uh, easily handled. And it's given on day zero and day four uh, with a short infusion time and could be given in peripheral vein without pre-medication or uh, any cytokine release. As we know, that is targeting CD25 or the interleukin-2. On the other hand, the uh, thymoglobulin or the rabbit anti-thymocyte globulin, which is prepared from the thymus gland, uh, the human thymus gland, which uh, thymocytes is injected in the rabbit for a month or more then the plasma of the rabbit is collected and the thymoglobin is uh, extracted and uh, it's given for the high risk patients and for the treatment of steroid resistant or severe uh, forms of uh, cellular uh, rejection uh, it is given in the first three to five days and induction therapy uh, however, it is administered over four to six hours and preferred to be through a central line with pre-medication to avoid the um, adverse uh, effects. Alumtuzumab is another depleting agent, but it's a monoclonal one targeting CD52. Uh, it depletes these cells, with the, inducing a state of profound uh, lymphopenia, uh, which extend uh, up to six months post-transplant, is given in a single dose prior to the transplantation, and also it needs to um, give uh, pre-medication to avoid the cytokine release uh, symptoms. This table illustrates the difference between the um, depleting and non-depleting agents. All have been mentioned before, but I want to stress on some uh, issues. Uh, as I said, that we need pre-medication before the using depleting agents to avoid these side effects and monitoring during infusion for the vital signs monitoring for the CBC, and uh, most importantly that we should keep in mind using anti-infective prophylaxis, especially for, for CMV. So whenever we use these depleting agents either for um, induction or treating uh, rejection, we should prescribe uh, all the way through uh, the anti-infective or anti CMV uh, prophylaxis 
this is not the case for the uh, alimtizim uh, for the um, basiliximab. Uh, as I mentioned early on, it's it's given in the uh, low risk patient with no uh, serious side effects. Uh, to know the mechanism or to understand the mechanism of the different immunosuppressive agent, we have to know the immune allorecognition. Uh, and in this scheme, we have the antigen-presenting cell, which could be dendritic cell, macrophage, etc., and which present the antigen to the T cell. So the immune allorecognition is a crosstalk between the antigen-presenting cell and the T cells. And this crosstalk occurs on three levels or three signals. The first signal is the talk between the major histocompatibility antigen of the antigen-presenting cell and the T cell receptor on the uh, T cell. And this signal results in the activation of a very important pathway in the T cell, which is the calcineurine pathway that will end up with formation of interleukin-2. And this interleukin-2 will initiate another signal, which is signal 3, but this could not happen without the signal 2, which is a co-stimulation signal. There is interaction between the CD80 and CD86 on the engine presenting cell side and the CD28 on the T cells. Then signal 3, which start by interleukin 2, which is produced by the calcineurine pathway, it will go outside the cell and activate the interleukin-2 receptor or the CD25 to activate another important pathway, which is the mTOR pathway that will end by the cell activation and cell proliferation. I think we should understand this um, um, mechanism by heart. So this video will illustrate more. When angiopresenting cells bind to the T cell receptors, activate them, and this activation result in a cascade of reactions that end with release of intracellular calcium. And the released calcium ion binds to and activate calcium enzyme, which is a calcium-dependent uh, phosphatase enzyme, calmedulin. The active calcineurine dephosphorylates the inactive, what is called NFAT, nuclear factor of T cell. And this will result to formation of active NFAT. Uh, the active NFAT traverse into the nucleus uh, to promote the transcription of the interleukin-2, and then the interleukin-2 moves the cytoplasm to the ribosome where the interleukin-2 is produced. Then the interleukin-2 molecule are released from the T cell in response to different stimuli to start a new cascade of cell-mediated immunity. The interleukin-2 binds to and activate the transmembrane receptor at the T cell. This activation process initiates a cascade of reaction that result in activation of the mTOR. And the active mTOR they're uh, regulating the important intracellular pathway that promote the cell growth and proliferation. So what happens if we give it happen when we get an um, uh, immunosuppression? For example, when we get cyclosporin, this cyclosporin can transverse into the cell membrane and bind to a specific intracellular uh, receptor called cyclophilin. And the uh, cyclosporin cyclophilin complex in turn binds to an inactivate 
the calcium uh, calcium urine enzyme therefore they inhibit the production of interleukin 2 so the cyclosporin inhibit production on the other hand when we give serolimus m inhibitor this bind to the intracellular uh, protein called the uh, fk binding protein and serolimus fk binding protein complex interfere with the function of the mTOR they so they suppress uh, uh, the proliferative effect of interleukin 2 so we can call the calcineurin inhibitors uh, in interleukin 2 uh, anti production of interleukin 2 while the mTOR is anti action of the interleukin 2 so both are acting in interleukin 2 one decreases the production and the other antagonize the action when we apply uh, the uh, these agents and the site of action on the immune allergy recognition uh, figure we can see that in uh, signal 2 signal 2 which is the stimulation of t cell receptor is blocked by the ATG and OCT3, which is not uh, used anymore. And the calcineurin pathway is blocked by the cyclosporin and tacrolimus. For signal 2, the co-stimulatory signal is blocked by the co-stimulatory uh, blockade, which is the platycept. And for signal 3, the uh, activation of interleukin 2 is blocked by the anti CD25 basiliximab or Simulex. And for the mTOR pathway, it's blocked by the mTOR inhibitor, either serolimus or everolimus. And the cell cycle or the cell proliferation is inhibited by the anti proliferative agents, which is the azacyprine or the mycophenolate mofetil acting on the Denevo uh, pathway. And alumtizumab, which is the, the other depleting uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, block the action of the uh, CD52. Uh, uh, while steroids, as you see, it's, it's a synonym-specific. Steroids have a lot of actions. Number one, inactivate the antigen presenting cell. Number two, it decreases the production of the interleukin 2 through suppression of interleukin 1, 6, 10, tumor necrosis factor, and interferon gamma. Uh, another point to notice that all induction therapies are acting on surface receptors. While the maintenance therapy, whether the calcineurin, steroids, um, uh, antiproliferative mTOR, are acting on intracellular pathways. And this is very important for the maintenance uh, agents. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the um, uh, immune suppressive used for treatment of rejection, we have to uh, to know what we are dealing, uh, what type of rejection we are dealing with. First of all, if it's cell mediated, as I mentioned, corticosteroid pulses, ATG, or is it antibody mediated rejection, which necessitated IVIG, plasma pharesis, rotexumab, etc. The IVIG. Simply, it decreases the production of antibodies. It neutralizes the anti chile antibody. It inhibits the uh, complement pathway. Uh, however, there is some adverse uh, effects that we might uh, encounter during its use. Uh, so it is the um, standard of care for the treatment of antibody-mediated rejection with the plasma pharesis. Rotexumab, which is a second line, it's not a first line in treatment of antibody mediated rejection. It's targeting CD20 on the P cells. It's causing rapid and sustained depletion of the P lymphocytes. Uh, of course, it has also some adverse effects in fusion that increase the uh, instance of uh, uh, rejection. 
bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, antiplasma cell, which is used mainly for treatment of multiple myeloma. This is another line for treated, treatment of resistant antibody-mediated uh, uh, rejection. The eclizumab, it's anti-complement 5, uh, humanized monoclonal antibody. It's not only used for treatment of uh, antibody-mediated rejection, but could you be used for treatment of atypical hemolytic remix syndrome and antiphospholipid syndrome, but uh, one of the barriers uh, for its use is the it's very expensive as the yearly cost is about a half a million dollar but the good news that uh, we will have uh, uh, in the near future um, a generic for in the egyptian market uh, within a few months to sell the map or actimra uh, the famous drug used in the COVID era, which is anti-interleukin-6. Uh, uh, it competitively inhibits the uh, interleukin-6 uh, and inhibiting the uh, signal transduction one. Uh, and there are some reports indicating the uh, success of using tocilizumab in treatment of chronic antibody-mediated uh, rejection and transplant glomerulopathy and sensitized patients. Blatacept, which is the uh, co-stimulatory blockade, uh, antagonizing CD80 uh, and 86 on the antigen-presenting cells. However, uh, it's not easy to use since it is, uh, it is used as uh, injection for um, first uh, 10 milligram per kg IV in day one, five, and in weeks two, four, eight, and 12, and then after the dose is reduced to half every four weeks. Uh, there is no dose adjustment for blaticeps, and it is not nephrotoxic or hepatotoxic. Uh, when we are using immunosuppressive, we should know by heart the side effects, the different side effects of the uh, immunosuppressive agent, and this table summarizes the different side effects uh, of course, hypertension and hyperglycemia is common with corticosteroid and CNI, also the hyperlipidemia, and uh, hyperlipidemia is also a common side effect with the mTOR inhibitors, um, delayed wound healing with the mTOR inhibitors, neurotoxicity with CNI, especially with uh, tacrolimus, nephrotoxicity with the CNI, uh, pancytopenia is a common feature with the antiproliferative agent, GI toxicity with the mycophenolate uh, mofetil, and the ulcers with the uh, mTOR inhibitor, especially with sterolimus. But more importantly, we should know the drug interactions. Most of uh, the immunosuppressive agents, especially the calcineurin inhibitors and mTORs, are acting on the cytochrome B. 3A4 uh, in the liver. So any enzyme inhibitor should will increase the level of the of these drugs, whether the CNI or mTOR inhibitors. These are examples for the inhibitors, the azole antivangal group, the uh, non dihydropyridamol um, um, uh, pyridine uh, calci uh, calcium channel blockers, and ma macrolides, uh, grapefruit, etc. On the other hand, the drugs the which reduce the activity of the um, the inducers which increase the activity of the uh, enzyme will result in uh, reduction of the drug level. So we should be aware we are prescribing this agent that we should increase within the same prescription the dose of these immunosuppressive effects, otherwise uh, rejection could occur. With mycophenolate mofetel, we should take care about the antacid and cholesteramine, which decrease the uh, absorption of uh, uh, MMF. And we should pay a lot of attention when we are prescribing aloberinol in patients who are receiving adacibrin because 
both drugs have uh, the end product uh, metabolite, which is 6 mercaptopurine, which is a potent uh, bone marrow suppressant. So when we uh, prescribe aloprenol in a patient receiving adathioprine, we should half the dose of the uh, adathioprine um, in the uh, in this situation. Otherwise, severe bone marrow suppression will occur within a week or two. So these are examples for the drugs, the inducers and inhibitors that increase the uh, inhibitors which increase the level and the inducers which decrease the uh, level of the uh, CNI. Now, we know about this agent, but the question is how to choose the immunosuppressive protocol, whether induction or maintenance. The choice should be tailored for each patient according to its risk stratifications and need and a lot of factors. So we are now in the era of personalized or precision medicine, and this uh, is applied fully uh, for the uh, immunosuppressive agent, and this will be the subject that will be discussed in the uh, next ESNT meeting by Professor Gamal Saadi, precision medicine or personalized immune suppression in uh, kidney transplantation. We stratified, we should stratify our patients prior to decision uh, of the uh, immune suppressive protocol according to this immune, uh, immunological stratification with uh, whether it's a low risk, medium risk, or high risk. And we choose the induction and maintenance therapy accordingly. The choice of these protocols uh, we should follow the guidelines and hopefully we have so this now I'll move to the second part I, I'm going to show you the uh, how to use the guidelines and I'm going I'm going to share with you some of the um, studies that have been uh, carried out on Egyptian transplant recipients so I'm going to mix between the Egyptian black guidelines and some of the studies that have made uh, in uh, Mansoura and uh, Egyptian uh, patients. Uh, hopefully we have this very nice guidelines that have, was published um, two years ago. Uh, this was the effort of a uh, huge effort actually by a group led by our late professor uh, Rashad Barsoum. And this uh, uh, article is freely and advise all of you to download it and read it carefully because it goes through and in depth for every detail in the uh, in discussing the uh, how to deal with immunosuppressive agents in different situations like uh, as I will show you the other source of personalization or choice of the immunosuppressive, uh, immunosuppressive agents is to follow the uh, the experience. And I'm going um, to share with you our experience uh, over four decades of using different immunosuppressive actions since we start our transplant in Mansoura and reaching this uh, number 300, the case that was transplanted uh, today is the case number 3,383, and uh, all these studies were uh, were uh, mentioned or was highlighted in this article about renal transplantation in Mansoura, and what we, this is the landmark with the introduction of each agent. Uh, during our practice since over uh, 40 years. And uh, the most important thing that when we introduced a certain agent in our clinical practice, this was through a randomized control trial. Starting from the conventional or the steroid and other cyprin, 
then for introduction of cyclosporin in early 80s and we used basilix map uh, in 1998 uh, and then we introduced to our bracts the tacrolimus and mmf then we used etg bolus as induction we used serolimus in 2001 we adopted steroid free regimen uh, 20 years ago we tried the alumtuzumab in 61 patients and then we tried the prolonged release uh, formula of uh, tacrolimus and uh, lately uh, the everolimus uh, for the guidelines we uh, give we uh, this is just uh, to revise I, I i know that all of you uh, know the how to uh, use the, the uh, strength of the uh, recommendations and the quality of evidence these are the 12 items that the egyptian clinical practice guidelines went in depth discussing all these points the induction oh. of uh, immunosuppression the maintenance of immunosuppression what is the advised current standard protocol when to start the immunosuppression the monitoring the frequency and the target levels and the th recommended therapeutic cni blood levels the mba trough level could be used in certain situations alternative protocols for certain patients, the use of long-acting formula, what about the generic immunosuppression and the modification of mental immunosuppression in different situations. I will go through uh, these uh, points uh, quickly. For the induction of immunosuppression, there is a recommendation that to include induction therapy with a biological agent as a part of, of immunosuppressive regimen, with the exception that the full match or two haplotype identical living related donor. But for the low risk patient, it's recommended to routinely use the uh, basiliximab or interleukin 2 receptor antagonist, rather no induction. And for high risk patient, we should use lymphocyte depleting agent. So this is the Egyptian recommendation, which is not so far from the KDEGO or the international recommendation. Actually, the Egyptian communication was a blend between the international guidelines and with some modification according to our uh, local situations. Uh, this is our uh, experience with the... Uh, using the basiliximab and this was the work of uh, professor hussein shaisha he reported the long term this was the five year uh, follow up for using the alumtuzumab this was a controlled randomized study between two groups group with induction and group without and he also reported the 10 year follow up of basiliximab what was the harvest? The harvest that basiliximab also significantly reduced the instance of acute rejection, but it added no benefit on the long term uh, on patient and graft survive. Then we used the alumtuzumab as precondi preconditioning or induction therapy, and it allows us to use a very um, uh, low toxic uh, regimen, steroid-free and calcineurin-free inhibitor regimen. What was the harvest of this protocol that we uh, carried out on 61 patients? We have 85% steroid-free and 75% uh, CNI-free as well. So most of these patients were kept on mTOR and antiproliferative agents only. For the maintenance immunosuppression, it's strongly recommended to start with a combination uh, medication, mostly triple therapy. And this triple therapy is uh, tacrolimus based. There is no more cyclosporin. It's tacrolimus, MMF, and bridnisolone. Um, and 
if tacrolimus or MMF cannot be used, we could recommend the replacement tacrolimus with cyclosporin and suggest using other cyclosporin instead of uh, MMF, especially in low risk patients. But the current standard protocol is the triple tacrolimus based therapy. Uh, and it is the preferred protocol for 90% of our survey responders during uh, preparation of this um, uh, guidelines and worldwide also. What we, this was documented actually uh, 10 years ago in our uh, report about uh, 2000 cases tr uh, transplanted in Mansoura when we compared over 40 years the different protocols, tacrolimus based, cyclosporin based, uh, triple therapy, cyclosporin, dual therapy, and as and steroids. And over 10 years, the most favorable outcome was with the tacrolimus based therapy, this in Brown. When to start the immunosuppression? It's one to two days prior to transplantation. And the rationale is to ensure the achievement of a good therapeutic level at the time of uh, exposure to the donor kidney. Uh, what about the uh, frequency? It strongly recommend frequent measurement in the first uh, three months for adequate dose adjustment and then to be less frequent thereafter. And with any deterioration of growth function uh, or significant uh, GIT manifestations or side effects, whether drug-related side effects are suspected or with introduction or withdrawal of drugs known to interact with cyclosporin absorption, uh, whether inducers or inhibitors, we should frequently monitor the CNI levels during this period. Uh, the target levels, it's recommended to be uh, a little bit high in the first three months, then uh, changing uh, the level afterwards according to the recipient immunological risk category, uh, aiming to achieve a lowest therapeutic but uh, safe window in the low and intermediate risk patients. These are the recommended um, trough levels between 8 and 12 nanogram per ml for the first uh, three months and then to decrease the dose thereafter after uh, to decrease to, uh, the uh, target level after six months. Uh, actually, there are a lot of uh, challenges in the monitoring of the CNI blood level. If the therapeutic level of CNI is difficult to achieve for clinical, from pharma, uh, pharmacokinetics or, or economic reason, we can suggest adding uh, enzyme uh, inhibitor to have a good level uh, like the calcium channel blocker or ket uh, ketokinazole to uh, achieve um, a, a target level without using too much uh, drug. And this is our experience, Mansoura, and co-administration of the ketoconazole, the famous antifungal, with the cyclosporin-treated patient. And um, uh, we did this controlled randomized uh, study on two groups of patients, uh, group receiving the small dose of ketoconazole and the other were not. And there was a concern at that time about the side effects and uh, the metabolic consequences of using this ketoconazole for a long time. But uh, our long-term follow-up of this study did not show any uh, of these um, concerns. And we use it also for with the uh, tacrolimus, not only for the cyclosporin, uh, not only with cyclosporin, for this prospective randomized study and the harvest of the using ketoconazole was as follow, that the ketoconazole CNI combination, a kidney transplant recipient was safe, outstanding impact on treatment cost with up to 70% reduction in the dose and of course of the cost, with significant reduction in the fungal infection in the 
ketoconazole treated group and improved patient and graft survival. But unfortunately, there was no uh, ketoconazole anymore in the market in Egypt on assumption that Cibatotex is uh, toxic, but this is an observation that we didn't notice or didn't report among our recipients, whether kidney transplant or nephrotic syndrome patients. Mm -hmm. We were using ketoconazole freely in our uh, nephrotic patients with mm -hmm. cyclosporin and tacronimus. What about the generic immune suppression? According to the guidelines, if an approved, should be approved, generic uh, is used, is strongly recommended to measure the drug blood level before and after switch from the original to the generic and adjusting the dose accordingly. Without this frequent monitoring, we cannot uh, use this generic. What about the mycophenolic acid trough level monitoring? It's suggested to measure mycophenolic acid uh, levels by the end of the first month post-transplant just to uh, uh, adjust the blood level and uh, to uh, calculate the recommended dose for each patient. This is one of the precision or personalized medicine in uh, immunosuppression and kidney transplantation and we need also this level in situations when the over or under uh, immunosuppression with the mycophenolate uh, mofetel is suspected in cases of repeated rejection or cases with severe side effects, especially the GIT side effects that we are commonly encountered with the use of mycophenolate mofetel. And we did this um, prospective uh, controlled uh, to, uh, randomized trial that was published uh, two years ago or three years ago in Saudi Kidney journal, uh, journal about the impact of monitoring of the MBA level among our recipients. And what we did found that we have a fixed group, fixed dose group of MMF, and the other group was tailored according to the MBA level. In the fixed group, there was a significantly higher instance of GIT manifestations. There was a higher instance of infection, anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. And of course, when we tailored our dose according to the level, we got a lot of uh, significant cost-saving benefits. Some patients were having the uh, target level with only a half gram of MMF per day, others are 750, uh, etc. So the using of fixed dose of 1.5 gram or 2 grams was uh, uh, accompanied by a, a lot of complication. And of course, it's a costly regimen. What about the long acting formula? For the long act formula of tacrolimus and microphenolate, Mofenolic acid are safe, effective, uh, and it's advisable not only for the uh, the issue of uh, adherence or uh, the uh, compliance, but there is another important point that I'm going to show you right now. Uh, we converted our patient in Mansoura safely from twice daily to once. Uh, daily. Uh, this was uh, very safe and it was one to one. Uh, this is the po important point that I see or that I uh, I want to stress on on using the uh, the long acting formula, which is the variability. We have two type of variability. We have intrapatient variability and interpatient variability. For the inter intrapatient variability, there is the, the within the same patient with the same dose, we have fluctuation in the trough level. And with interpatient variability, there is tendency in the same dose of tacrolimus between patients to produce different exposure. What is the value of this? According to this significant study, or this is a very good study, which studied the 
um, relation between the coefficient of variant, if this is the, the variation of the intra-patient variability in the trough level is more than 30%, this was attended with increasing development of the um, DSA. Uh, and this related to the uh, non-sustained uh, or the fluctuation of the twice daily uh, tacrolimus dose in comparison with the 20, uh, once daily dose. Not only on the development of the uh, DSA, but this curve also shows that when there is a intrapatient variability, there is increased failure of graft secondary to uh, uh, development of rejection, mostly antibody mediated rejection. And this study was uh, uh, showed significantly that we could get benefit from the uh, bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of the uh, once daily uh, dose of the CNI, mainly tacronyms. What about the modification of immune suppression in pregnancy? Strongly recommend that females who wish to become pregnant should be switched from MMF to Alcibrim at least six weeks prior to uh, attempting pregnancy. Or when we discover pregnant lady uh, discover pregnancy um, on uh, while the patient on micrognet should be switched at once to uh, Alcibrim. And it's recommended that female uh, patients also should stop mTOR inhibitor three months before attempting pregnancy to be replaced by um, uh, um, the, um, I mean, the, uh, they could be replaced by the uh, azathioprine, the antiproliferative. Uh, and for males, kidney transplant recipients, it's advised that uh, they should reduce, they should uh, monitor their sperm count as the uh, serolimus or mTOR inhibitor in general can cause, uh, decrease the sperm uh, counts. For the elderly patient, we suggest that CNI blood trough level uh, in kidney transplant patients above 65 years with stable graft to be uh, at lower, uh, at, at low window and uh, for patients who develop rejection, we should revise ourselves. We should intensify the maintenance immune suppression following the recovery of the acute uh, rejection, either by increasing the target drug level or switching patients uh, from cyclosporin to tacrolimus or, or from azathioprine to MMF. And patients who develop CNI uh, toxicity with rising serum creatinine, uh, we suggest switching to the mTOR inhibitors uh, or to have a low window of or a low level of the uh, CNI or to use a platycept. But there is a concern about the use of platycept, of course, as you know, in the Epstein, Epstein and uh, uh, virus positive patients. Um, steroid minimization or elimination protocol that we adopted 20 years ago in our center. Uh, actually, uh, we reported our first report after using uh, the three years. Uh, this is one of the three years follow up uh, after using um, steroid avoidance in this controlled randomized uh, prospective uh, trial. And we reported also the long term up to 12 year uh, results of steroid avoidance. We didn't find any significant difference either in the patient or the graft uh, survivor uh, rates between the steroid based and steroid avoidance. But on the other hand, we got a lot of benefits of using this steroid free regimen, a low uh, incidence of new onset diabetes after transplantation, 5% versus 15%. Uh, less hypertension, 40% versus 80%, malignancy, 0% versus 4%, infections with, a, with different uh, 
uh, microbes, bacterial, viral, uh, etc., were significantly less in the um, steroid avoidance group. So we got a lot of benefits with using this steroid avoidance regimen, but also uh, with, with in pediatric group, uh, we had a significant post transplant catch up in the gross, decreased cardiovascular risk factors, uh, lower instance hypertension, lipidemia, and diabetes, and of course, we get a uh, co uh, cost saving uh, issues. And we did this study studying the cost saving between the steroid uh, based therapy and steroid avoidance. We found a lot of cost saving because of uh, the um, treating the comorbidities uh, associated with the use of corticosteroid, whether diabetes, hypertension, bone disease, gastritis, antibiotics, antifungals, etc. But who is eligible for steroid minimization protocols? It's indicated only in low risk patients and in pediatrics. And we believe that there are some essentials when we are adopting such protocol that we should use induction therapy. We cannot uh, perform steroid free regimen without induction. We should have a powerful, a potent maintenance therapy, tacrolimus and MMF. We cannot use cyclosporin and add the cybrin in uh, steroid free regimen. We should perform Immunologic, immunologic surveillance or screening uh, after transplantation, either uh, screening for DSA or surveillance or protocol biopsy. Uh, for the uh, treatment of acute rejection, according to the uh, Egyptian um, guidelines, strongly recommend the IV pulse steroids for T cell mediated rejection and using uh, ATG or thymocyte globulin in cases steroid resistant rejection or if the uh, rejection was severe from the start above the Banff grade one uh, for T cell mediated rejection. Again, uh, we uh, recommend treating acute rejection with IVIG for antibody mediated rejection, IVIG and plasma exchange with or without rotexamab. So please, Rotexamab is not the first line in treatment in antibody mediated rejection. The first standard of care is IVIG and plasma exchange, and rotexamab in resistant or second line cases. Uh, in acute rejection, we strongly recommend the checking the compliance. This is very important, especially in late rejection. The compliance should be checked. Intensifying the maintenance immune suppression after treating acute rejection, adding or restoring maintenance prednisolone in patient who was steroid uh, free, uh, recommend adding or restoring uh, tacrolimus in patient who was not on CNI or have uh, low window of CNI. So what's our current protocol now is that we stratify our patients uh, either low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. For low moderate for low risk patients, we use bacilizumab induction and tacrolimus and MMF without steroids. For mid moderate risk patients, the same, <laughs> but <laughs> the maintenance uh, protocol is <laughs> with <laughs> steroids. And for the high risk patient, we use thymoglobulin with the treble uh, therapy, uh, tacrolimus, MMF, and steroid. So this is our uh, current protocol. Uh, to conclude that despite all the improvement in tissue matching and immunosuppression, still an important proportion of graft is still lost following uh, live kidney trans live donor kidney transplantation. So, so so efforts must be directed to identify better regimens which can provide adequate immune suppression and minimal nephrotoxicity as well as the metabolic pregnancy and cardiovascular uh, consequences. And this is uh, the dream is to develop 
a novel safe approach that will promote the sustained donor specific specific immune hyperresponsiveness, lowering the incidence and severity of both acute and chronic rejection, and uh, reduce the uh, patient dependence on uh, anti-rejection or inducing a state of uh, tolerance. So the take-home message that follow-up of a transplant patient, is, as I said, is an art, and always work with the transplant centers and nephrologists who are well-trained in immune suppressive management and always follow the guideline. Thank you very much. And I would like to end with this picture of our mm -hmm. nephrology and transplantation team that we were honored to have the pioneer between us, Professor Onim and Professor Muhammad um, Sobe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank thank, you, thank you very much for this. Mm, thank, uh, you very much. thank you, Professor Ayman, for this uh, highly elegant and uh, comprehensive talk. And before we go with Professor Hani with the discussion, I would like to thank our uh, coordinator today, Dr. Hazem Abishusha, for his work regarding this session, uh, especially and all of the work of CME chapter. So please, Professor Hani. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ayman, for this very elegant talk and congratulations for having now uh, a record of 3,383 transplants. This is a very good uh, registry uh, since 1976. Uh, actually, I will start by having some uh, uh, question. The first will be regarding the campus, because I see that in 2005, you got uh, an, uh, an important study showing that uh, we can give uh, a single drug uh, after giving uh, the, the campus. What is the long-term follow-up of those patients? Because I see in your recent protocols, you did not include the campus anymore. Uh, actually, the reason behind that, that Cambeth and Alamzab was not available in Egypt anymore. And I, I, I contacted several companies outside Egypt before the the era of the UPA and so on. And we were ready, we, uh, I mean, to, to have this magic, uh, consider it a magic drug. Uh, some of our patients are still on one tablet of serolimus, one milligram, and that's it. And uh, one tablet of uh, azathioprine, and that's it. So the reason behind is that it was not uh, any more available in Egypt since 2011. Uh, but I think also, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ayman, yeah, there is uh, some concern all over the world that it, it may increase the CMV activation and the lymphomas. And that's why it's not very popular now in the protocols in uh, internationally, uh, even in the places in which it is available. So actually, I, these concerns was was not was not uh, uh, reported. This was a fear, yes, actually, yes. in the first place. But according to the several reports, and I think it is still used now. Uh, I think uh, Halawa is still giving in their protocol one uh, dose sub Q uh, prior to transplantation in their regimen. Uh, I think the these reports of uh, the fear of malignancy and infection, and especially CMV, uh, they were comparable with other induction therapies. Okay. Uh, the, professor, the, prof uh, Father uh, Professor. Uh, 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 my second uh, question, uh, I think uh, you, you mentioned uh, with Bilatacept that it should not be used in AB, uh, ABV uh, v, uh, positive patient. I, I think you mean by, uh, should not be used in ABV negative patient, right? Due to augmented post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. Yes, who, develop, oh, who, yes, oh. who developed uh, post-transplant ABV. I mean, uh, oh. Oh. yes, they were negative and converted uh, for conversion of post <laughs> post-transplant. Yes, oh. yes. Oh. yes. The, the the last uh, question regarding uh, tocilizumab, Actemra. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that it has got uh, some uh, yes, good results. responses in chronic rejection. You know yes. that chronic rejection is still uh, a nightmare all yes. over the world. So do do do, do did you try uh, in Mansoura to have some uh, 
data about that, or is only a recent publication and do not uh, apply? This data? was a small series, actually, Professor Haney. These are small series about uh, tulisizumab. Uh, this, um, I think, in this report there was uh, six patients, and the other report were only ten patients. I mean, uh, there is no solid data about. Uh, uh, the use of uh, tulisizumab uh, as a standard or auxiliary treatment in the treatment of uh, resistant antibody mediated rejection. These are a small series, actually, we cannot uh, rely, but it's one of the, um, the agents used in the chronic <coughs> antibody mediated rejection. Thank you. I think. Uh... Uh, Dr. Thank you, yes, Professor Hani. Few questions. Uh, few questions. Yes. yes, we have many questions in the chat yes. and. Uh... Professor Ahmed Halawa wants to comment. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ayman, my friend, my colleague, my brother, for all this, you know, um, uh, wonderful experience of Mansoura. Just I would like to remind everybody that risk stratification is different from one place to another. It depends on the catchment population you're dealing with. Yes. Of course, you know, you deal uh, with mixed race. The Egyptians are mixed race. So the... You know, the uh, immunological risks is nearly equivalent to the Asian, maybe a bit in, you know, inferior to the uh, Afro-Caribbean. So you're dealing with, a, you know, um, different, you know, group of people uh, and different genetic uh, makeup. So what we call it high risk in, uh, in the UK could be different mm -hmm. risk category in, in Egypt. Yes. Uh, in terms of um, risk um, stratification, uh, uh, we in the UK mainly based on the DSA profile. Hmm. You know, we tend to ignore because of of course with the disease donor transplantation is very active. You know, eighty percent of our practice is disease donor transplantation. We don't like this practice because in the middle of the night or the weekend and bank holidays and you know it's very unsociable. Uh, so uh, we transplant two, 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 mismatch two, one, two, mismatch, you know, uh, we, we don't regard it as immunological high risk, but history of positive cross match or uh, the presence of historical uh, the DSA is considered intermediate risk, provided mm -hmm. that the current cross match is negative. Um, uh, I would like to uh, retreat a, uh, and comment on uh, Professor Ayman uh, regarding the um, um, uh, campus. Campus, we use it, yes, single dose subcut, and is associated with when we tried campus, it was part of the three <laughs> study, <laughs> multi center trial. And we didn't use any prophylaxis for CMV. All patients we uh, we treated with campus or the campus arm in Sheffield got CMV. So afterwards, so we decided that uh, every patient uh, receiving campus should have CMV prophylaxis for 200, uh, two, you know, 200 days. Uh, we give it subcut as well, uh, you know, rather than IV. Uh, and uh, the license is for intravenous use. But we found actually Leeds, which is not far from us, 30 miles north. They use it successfully single dose uh, subcut. So we thought, ah, oh, why not to use it that way? Uh, especially Liverpool, they used to give the standard, which is two doses, day zero, and day one, IV, 30 milligram IV, and they had mortality, anaphylaxis in the, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the anesthetic room, which is, which was a disaster. So therefore, a CAM bath, we use it quite often for high risk immunological, high risk patients, and is much better. And we think we haven't done, you know, um, uh, um, yeah. um, uh, in economical studies to see the cost, but it's much better to give subcuts rather than having um, ATG or monitoring ATG and, uh, you know, through the central vein and patient. If, he, he, if the patient doesn't have a line, you have to put a central line. All this has, I have to give it for three, four days, whatever. And you have to monitor the, uh, you know, the the uh, the blood count. We monitor actually ETG when we give it by the white cell count and the platelet. No CD3, uh, C CD3 anymore. We stopped at this a long time ago because it's it, it's costly and the platelet and white cell count can give you a clue. So this is actually my my, my comment. So um, just remember that our high risk patient not necessarily to be your high risk patient. Thank you, Professor Ayman. 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 Thank you, Professor Ayman
Thank you. Yes, Thank totally you, Professor agree that the, the, the risk stratification is different from area to area, Absolutely. from race to race. Yeah, Absolutely. so that's why I'm, 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 I'm concentrating on the Egyptian Brex guidelines. I mean, the, the, the international or guidelines could not be uh, applicable in our community. That's why this was the rationale be, be, behind uh, fashioning our establishment of an Egyptian Brex guideline. The other thing about the campus and CMV uh, and uh, the use of uh, prophylaxis, as I mentioned, that prophylaxis should be used for all depleting antibodies, whether CMV, ATG, oh. monoclonal, yeah. monoclonal, yeah. any yeah. depleting antibody necessitate in, uh, the use of uh, prophylaxis for CMV. Yeah, regarding Professor Hani's question, you know, campus associated with increased incidence of PTLD, it's not confirmed. I mean, honestly, we there is no proper study to demonstrate uh, that uh, campus is associated with increased incidence of PTLD. But infection, like any depleting antibodies, uh, you can talk about it for you know forever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ahmad and Professor uh, Ayman. We have uh, some questions on the chat about the use, the first about the use of uh, voclosporin in pregnancy. Uh, there is some reports that uh, allow the use uh, in pregnancy, but I, I, I don't think it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's not well established or there is any uh, guidelines or international recommendations for uh, their solid safety and using in pregnancy. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the, the vacuous boring. Uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. There are some reports that it, it, it is safe during pregnancy as uh, the uh, cyclosporin, but uh, we don't have actually any experience with the use of vacuous boring in our patient. I, I, and I think in Egypt, if there is any uh, centers adopting the uh, vacosporin in their uh, transplant or even the um, government rice patients, I I'm not aware. Oh, I'm not aware. Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Felish Yerki about uh, it is, is still uh, your opinion in uh, still using the FK level? The, the FK level? Uh, uh. Uh, the importance of the level? Of course, of course. Mm. There are recent studies that uh, they increase the target levels nowadays, and there are some studies that show that uh, sh the critical level is now is uh, 7 uh, nanogram per ml. Below uh, this level, there are uh, some reports in that there is increasing uh, rejection, especially antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, and despite that, the recommendation that to keep the level between 5 and 8, but there are uh, several uh, recent uh, literature that uh, advising keeping the level uh, 7 or uh, above. So okay, monitoring is very important. Uh, I mean, there is no, there is no, um, I mean, ideal practice or uh, practice for the, even for the mTOR inhibitors. There are some uh, center that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, see that uh, this is not important to monitor the uh, mTOR uh, level. No, still the levels uh, of the mTOR and CNI should be, adequately uh, and routinely monitored. Professor Hani, do you have an additional comment or? Uh... No, I agree that uh, keeping, uh, uh, the, uh, yani measuring the level serially is still uh, internationally recommended. Yes. It's not obsolete. Yes. Okay. Uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen, please. Hey, I'm sorry. Thank Thank you, uh, Professor, Professor Ayman, excellent talk and uh, uh, excellent overview. We we learned a lot uh, tonight. Uh, my, I wonder how many of your patients uh, develop tolerance because you have a very big series of patients, and I think probably some of those could have tolerance either uh, tolerance by its mean, or they just uh, don't take the medication for a, a period of time and they still they have a good graft. Uh, 
Yes, this by uh, we uh, confronted some patient by chance. They stopped their treatment as they are tolerance, but we we were not intended to in to 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 withdraw or to stop the medications. So the patients who are tolerant in our season, they they this was by chance. They stopped medications okay. for several months and they are keeping a good graft function. Okay. And you initiate yeah, the it? drug after that? Uh, <laughs> this was a dilemma, actually. We initiated yeah. a small dose. We advised for a small dose, especially for the CNI, uh, okay. rather than uh, restoring the uh, three uh, drugs or the triple therapy. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. A question on the chat, uh, Professor Ayman, about your experience uh, uh, about IVIG protocols. Uh, do you recommend a specific protocol or the usual protocol from Dr. Asalwa Rubi? No, this is uh, the, the usual protocol, and uh, the uh, we have the high dose and the, uh, the low dose, but uh, at the end of the day, we judge it according to the histological changes, the, the level of DSA, the uh, the degree of renal function, and how acute is the the deterioration of the renal function. I mean, we uh, tailored the, the whether high dose or low dose according to uh, for uh, patient by patient, according to the severity and situation of the patients. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Hashem Sayed wants to comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed Professor Ayman. We have a very uh, long experience. And thank you again for uh, memorizing us with the, the story of ketokinazole in the early thousands and its effect on the level. Uh, my question about the genetics. You, you mentioned perfectly that genetics, we have to test pre and post the genetics. Although the genetic way of approval is the same way of the brand or trade name. So is it an international guide to measure or it's your experience or opinion? Because I, I feel that if it's a generic is approved by the FDA and other, especially in the uh, European countries, uh, such, a, such a level we have to measure or we have to define that. Uh, I need to understand from your side. Uh, the recommendation for the generic drug, number one, it should be approved, better to be FDA approved. Number two, when you decide to shift from the brand to the generic, you should uh, frequently monitor the drug level. If you don't have the facility to monitor frequently, don't uh, switch. Um, and uh, a central policy is very important. So far in Mansoura, we are using only the uh, originals. We uh, we didn't introduce any generic in the transplantation practice, but we use these generics in treatment of uh, glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. But this is a central policy uh, rather than, uh, I mean, uh, a guide. Uh, yes, that's why I'm asking, because generic, it should be approved. Uh, by the pharmaceutical uh, production, FDA or uh, EMA, yes. by European. So yes. uh, I think if it's approved, I don't have to uh, test before uh, or lost the confidence with the generics. Especially in UK nowadays, uh, a lot of Professor Halawa may correct me, that generics are uh, currently used in UK uh, heavily. So uh, we need just to clarify that here. But the uh, generic used in the UK is not the same which is offered in outside UK. This is very important. I okay. mean, uh, yes, it means a lot. It means a lot. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I mean, uh, if we have the uh, the UK uh, approved by the EMA or the uh, that in, uh, used in USA approved by the FDA. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you should be cautious. These are transplant patients. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, well, well understood for sure. I, I believe in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Professor Isham. Uh, uh, regarding the level for uh, the frequent monitoring, Professor Ayman, do you recommend a specific regimen or just to uh, to decrease the interval between uh, recommended levels internationally? Level? Uh, 
what we are doing in uh, our Brax and Mansoura that we uh, monitor the level uh, twice weekly in the first month, then weekly afterwards and in the second month, and then every two weeks. I mean with the generics. With the generics. With ah, the generics. More frequent use. Yes. Uh, when we switch with the generic, you uh, monitor twice weekly until you uh, achieve the uh, therapeutic level that was achieved with the brand. Okay. This is very important. Twice weekly. Yes. Thank you. A question from Professor Dalia Rojdi about uh, did you observe uh, somewhat decreasing incidence of CMV with the use of uh, uh, the current immunosuppressive regimens or uh, the same uh, like before? Uh, okay. We are adopting now the policy. The, as you know, there are two policies in the CMV prophylaxis, either uh, the, uh, the routine uh, prophylaxis from day zero or the surveillance or the you know, the, the you are going to uh, monitor the uh, antigenemia and to introduce or you do the uh, to give the prophylaxis uh, if there is increasing titer but there is increased uh, instance of CMV um, uh, infection or disease because of the uh, routine uh breaks of giving uh antiviral from uh, day uh, zero and uh, the good uh, i mean stratification of the of the uh, of the patient in the first place with the 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 donor and recipient uh, IgG status uh, whether it's a high risk low risk or intermediate uh, risk so i think with the uh, routine and mass um, prophylaxis of uh, uh, the CMV prophylaxis. This was behind the uh, the uh, decreasing instance of the uh, disease. This was not hey, adopted before. For uh, and uh, I want to highlight that uh, according to Kidigo and the international. Um, uh, guidelines but, the prophylaxis is done by the valgan cycloviral site but we did a prospective randomized study because of the cost of this val site we compared uh, our patient, we compared two groups group received valgal cycloviral site and the other group received val cycloviral which is much much cheaper uh, than uh, valgan and Valtrex. the Valtrex, yes, and the results were, were the same in everything, in, in the antigenemia, in the occurrence of CME disease, in the side effects, they were the same. So our current protocol in Mansoura and is to use the general prophylaxis with Val uh, Cyclover, uh, unless the patient is high risk, and by high risk, I mean uh, positive kidney, to a negative uh, recipient. In this case, only we use the van gal cyclovir. Otherwise, it's uh, val cyclovir. If Professor Ahmad Halawa, thank you, Professor Ahmad Halawa. Oh, thank you very much. Please. Yeah, I, I would like just to come to make two comments. Number one, on the generic. Look, you know, you can see Mansour is very careful. Actually, in the UK, all the immunosuppressions are generic, but. Yes. We, we do a pilot study first before uh, generalizing that change. So the pilot study will check the drug level and the rejection rate. And we run it for three months before approving the generic. Replying to uh, Professor Hisham Sayed, approved by the FDA, yes, but where, what population? It could be in Africa, it could be in Asia, it could be in mixed race the population is different from one place to another. So therefore, we shouldn't grant any uh, generic without trying the generic, without testing the generic in our own population. You can say that in the UK, 93% um, are white, 7% are non-white. Of course, I'm one of the non-white. But again, within the white, the metabolism is different. And within each region in the UK, the, uh, the, the, uh, the constitution is different. 
So in, in Sheffield, there are a lot of Asians. In London, a lot of African Caribbeans. So you can tell the big difference in population. Therefore, we have to try the genetic by pilot studies. The second question is, which is for all of you to think about it. So if you remember basil Ximab, basil Ximab was introduced and the other arm was cyclosporin. But now we are in Tacrobamus era and Mansura and um, many international studies. So Tacrobamus is much more powerful compared to cyclosporin, associated with less rejection rate. Do you think that basiliximab, using basiliximab in tacrolimus era is a sensible option or not? Okay. We use it in tacrolimus era and the controlled randomized study was in tacrolimus era. And uh, someone may argue that so far there is no difference in the patient and graft survival with using or not using the induction therapy. What not? To, what not? What to use it? And the answer is there is a significant decrease in the reje in the uh, rejection rate with the induction therapy, even in tacrolimus era. So I'm going to save uh, a lot treatment of rejection, the kidney biopsy, hospital admission, the sequel of anti-rejection. So although there was no on the long term uh, benefit on the patient graft survival, yet there is a benefit on the significant decrease of instance rejection with its sequel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is based on your study? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh... We have some questions on the chat, Professor Ayman. Uh, one minute, please. Ah, in... Yes. Uh, did you adopt late initiation of CNI? If you will use ETG induction? Uh, uh, ETG induction, uh, I mean, there are two different situations. Uh, we introduce it in the uh, from day zero if there is good uh, immediate graft function. We use it from day zero, even minus one or minus two. But mm. in cases of ATN and um, delayed graft function for five days a week or 10, we don't introduce the CNI uh, until the patient start to show good urine output and uh, some improvement in the uh, graft function. So if I'm going to use the induction therapy, the ETG for just this patient is a high risk patient, but he, his performance of the graft was very good from day one. Yes, I used the uh, tacrolimus with the ATG. But in case of anuria or urguria or delayed graft function, no, I withhold the CNI until improvement of the graft function and slowly introduce it after that. Uh, another uh, question. I have a comment on Professor that. Professor Hani, uh, I have a comment uh, that uh, we are now, uh, Dr. Ayman, uh, preparing with Dr. Halawa some guidelines of use of immunosuppression in case we started a cadaveric program. Yes. And I think yes. this question is very relevant to yes. cadaveric transplantation. Yes, yes. Because, because in cadaveric transplantation, we are usually confronted with delayed graft function. Yes. So we this is not, the rule. Yes, ah, to have so the ATN is the start, rule. We will yes. not start uh, the chronomus yes. except when we have a good. Uh, uh, we'll start the induction uh, and then we'll wait, uh, wait until there is a good function. Yes. Uh, in case we start cadaveric program. Yes. Uh, another related question, uh, Dr. Ayman, about uh, in case of rejection and targeting the level of FK to 10 to 12 milligram, uh, do you agree with this or uh, uh, another level? Actually, we keep it in the first uh, days or two weeks or around 10. 
then start so far there is a good urine output there is uh, i mean there is a nice drop in serum creatinine we keep it uh, around 10. afterwards it the the window is between five to eight okay there was one question uh, comparing uh, uh, serolimus with uh, everolimus Yes. Yes. In your experience, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, this question was raised uh, five years ago in our center, and we uh, started a head-to-head -head trial, which was not, uh, I mean, carried out before because uh, many are considering the uh, virolimus and serolimus are the same drug from the same group. But we believe that uh, the efficacy and side effects may be uh, different. So that's why we uh, convert uh, the two drugs in a controlled, randomized trial. And we are recruiting uh, the data uh, currently. Okay, thank you. Another uh, question from Dr. Rami Shahat about the use of PSP and for CMV, uh, and CMV prophylaxis. Only for six months or prolonged duration? For CMV is three months and BCP is three, six months. Okay. So, Professor Hani, I can see no more questions, not answered, unanswered questions on the chat and no more comments. So, I think we can close now. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ayman. Thank you. It was a, a marvelous night. Uh, starting from the basics and going to the details of a very long experience, more than 3,000 cases in Mansoura, and uh, a very hot discussion from uh, eminent professors all over the world. And uh, I hope uh, this will be a very good start for uh, Dr. Yasser uh, program uh, in 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ayman, really, uh, Thank for you this. Much. Uh, Highly interesting and uh, very comprehensive lecture about uh, immunosuppressive regimens and kidney transplantation that I think it will be a recorded reference in our uh, channel uh, and we'll see more and more views and will be a, a real reference for real practice and for uh, postgraduate uh, students. Thank you, uh, Thank you. All, uh, Professor Hani for uh, being with us with your very interesting uh, comments and discussions as usual and for uh, your uh, heavy information, especially in the field of transplantation. Thank you all professors who shared us this uh, uh, session today. Uh, Professor Ahmad Halawa, Professor Hisham Sayyid, uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen, and for all attendees that remained active till this late moment, this uh, very interesting scientific night. Thank you and excuse me to close this interesting session. At Sabah al khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.